I'm going to do first is just take us through what nutmeg is in terms of an ingredient, in terms of a natural commodity. So where it's from, how it grows, just so we can really sort of understand what it is we're talking about. And then I'll hand over to Peter to talk a little bit about the history of nutmeg. It's something far and away we take for granted these days, like salt and pepper, lemons and limes and sugar. But that was not always the case. So Peter's got some great stories with gory details to share with us. And then we'll move on to more, some more practical areas of how to actually get the most of nutmeg in your bar. And we've got some great cocktail examples from friends all over the world, how they're currently using nutmeg, again, to inspire. If you have burn-in questions that just can't wait, do put up your hands. Otherwise, we should have 10 minutes or so at the end to field some of your questions, OK? So then, to start off with, uh, we welcome you with a cocktail because it's proven to be the best way to make friends. <laughs> this is a very classic punch. Punch is arguably the first mixed drink, even predates the cocktail itself. Um, and a true classic punch isn't a punch without nutmeg. We know about these five components of spice, of, of uh, five components, sorry, that go into making a punch, one of which is spice. But in the beginning, it was always nutmeg that was uh, the spice. So we thought it would be a great example to start off with. This is a classic punch like the one served at the Dead Rabbit that uh, Jack has on the menu there. Quite simple. Tell them I'll do some Irish breakfast tea, a little fresh lemon, a lemon oleosaccharum, and of course, You've guessed nutmeg. it, nutmeg. nutmeg. <laughs> if anyone out there is playing nutmeg bingo, there's your first one. <laughs> we should have made the tasting match. The secret word is. Yeah. <laughs> and the code for the Wi-Fi is? <laughs> so what is nutmeg then? This is how nutmeg grows. This is an evergreen tree. This is the nutmeg tree. It really looks like any other. Growing up in England, you know, we have lots of sort of green countrysides. And to me, this tree looks like it, it could just be one of many that grows quite commonly. Uh, but this is actually the nutmeg tree, which, by the way, wouldn't grow in England because our climate is terrible for many reasons, <laughs> the least of which is it's not suitable for growing nutmeg trees. Um, but what's interesting then about the nutmeg tree is it's the fruit that you can see up here that grows on the tree. And this fruit, the first time I saw it, uh, reminded me of a peach, and it kind of looks a little like that. It's slightly paler in color. It's more of a yellow. And then when it opens, much like a peach, it has this kernel on the inside. So we have the fruit, or the flesh, if you will, of the nutmeg fruit, which itself is quite bland. It doesn't really have much flavor. The value, the secret, is all on the very inside. And I was wondering, this struck me the first time I understood it, that with a peach, you know, you eat the fruit and you throw away the stone, right? So I wonder how long it took us to realize that it was actually that very inner part of the nutmeg fruit that held all the value or the aroma or the flavor that we use today. Um, and nutmeg back in the beginning, and we'll get into this with Peter, was a very expensive commodity. There was a time where nutmeg was way more valuable than gold. But just consider for a moment that it could have been much like the stone of a peach that you just ate the fruit and threw it out. It's just quite curious to me. Um, you'll see then as the fruit opens that you can see a little bit of red. This is the acryl or the casing of the nutmeg, often known as mace or mace blades. And actually you each have in front of you, Oprah came by this morning and <laughs> delivered <laughs> Rod Marcus, Chicago's Oprah. <laughs> yes, uh, from Rare Tea Cellars, thank you very much. We have a little portion of mace for you. So mace and nutmeg go hand in hand, but mace really refers to that outer shell. So it's a very similar flavor and aroma, but it's the outer casing of nutmeg. And it can be bright red, um, or the case that you have now, it's more like a dark brown, looks like a bark, but this is the outer shell um, of the nutmeg. So that's what we have inside. So the tree bears this fruit. The tree itself takes about four to six to seven years to come to maturity. And thereafter, it bears fruit uh, constantly every year. So for the first four to five years, it's just a tree growing. Uh, so it takes a little bit of investment, a bit of patience, but then it will bear the fruit. Um, and what happens here is that the fruits will fall naturally from the tree. So when it comes time to harvest nutmeg, or when it comes time to collect nutmeg to be processed, the farmers uh, will collect the nutmegs from the floor, 
uh, open up the fruit, take out the insides, or they'll bash the trees to let it fall down naturally. Uh, that's kind of how it happens. It's an ongoing process. So there's no sort of magic power period for nutmeg fruits. Uh, it happens on a continual basis. Um, and what happens, certainly, we're going to reference Grenada. Grenada, Grenada, <laughs> potato, patata. We still don't know. Peter and I went down to Grenada to do some research just for your education. We didn't research uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. Two, two days in the Caribbean just for your education um, and came back still not knowing how to pronounce the place. Um, but anyhow, uh, it's one of the world's leading regions of nutmeg production. So we studied how they process nutmeg. They have plantations all over the island and their farmers get the fruits on the floor, get the, the insides, the, the nutmegs out, and then they're collected in sacks. They go around and collect from the farms across the islands and bring those in. And they're collected twice a week, which signifies that you know, the fruit keeps popping out quite, quite regularly. If we look at the botanical name then, Myristica fragrance is the botanical name of nutmeg. That answers your first burning question. Um, but what's interesting to me here, I know, what's interesting to me here is the word fragrance, right? Fragrant, aromatic, aroma, beautiful smells. This to me is one of the key parts of nutmeg. It's a key part of why we use it in cocktails. If you already think about garnishing with fresh nutmeg, you see it, the first thing you do is you just smell it. And as we know from past uh, wonderful seminars on mint and other <laughs> such studies, aroma <laughs> is so important to taste. So when you detect something, uh, when you smell something, it goes straight up to the limbic part of your brain, which is connected with uh, memory and emotion, and it triggers uh, emotions. It triggers some understanding, and it starts to prepare your palate and eventually your stomach for the flavors that are going to come. So aroma is so important in food and beverage. It's so important in cocktails, which is why garnishes, using natural ingredients for garnishes, whether it's a simple lemon twist, which is essential oils, or fresh mint, essential oils, or in this case, nutmeg, which will contain essential oils. It's the aroma that's so valuable. Um, so it's no surprise to me then that fragrance is a very important part of this natural um, commodity that we have. The root of the word then, uh, hopefully there are some non-Americans in the room. No offense, <laughs> too late, right? So nutmeg can also mean this, right? If you shoot a football through someone's legs, it's called a nutmeg. Jack, you can back me up on this yep, because no one else way. seems to uh, <laughs> register it. Um, it's, it's something that we've always known. So if you're playing football and it goes through the legs, it's like, oh, he just nutmegged that player or he nutmegged the goalie. Um, and this refers to the origin of this is, we'll hear this from Peter a lot, but there was a lot of back and forth with the English and the Dutch when they were fighting to seize control of the nutmeg plantations out in Indonesia and control the trade because it was so, so valuable, as I mentioned, at a time um, more valuable than gold. So what they would do when something's very valuable and nothing's changed today is to try and cheat the system. So rather than a big sack of nutmeg, they might fill the belt bottom with pebbles and just the very top with nutmeg and try and sell that off as a sack of nutmeg. So there was trickery involved. So it became known as nutmegging someone was to trick them. And that's where we think uh, this has come from in football. Sorry, soccer. It's <laughs> making more sense now. <laughs> there is another version of how the word nutmeg came to uh, rely on, on this kind of um, action. And for that one, you can look it up yourself on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not going to say that up here. Moving on. Um, again, if we look at the timeline of the word nutmeg, and often when we research what the word means or where it came from and, and where in history we started using it, we get an idea for, for truly what the word represents. So you can see both in old uh, French and English and even Latin, you've got this idea of, of a nut, which is the sort of shape and appearance and size of nutmeg, and this idea of, again, fragrance or musk or musket which comes through. So it's just, it's always rooted in this idea of some fragrance uh, throughout time. So a little bit about where nutmeg comes from then. Nutmeg originally comes from Indonesia and specifically the Banda Islands, 
which are quite tricky to get to, especially if you live in the 1600s and have no maps of the world and no idea that the world's, you know, how it's made up or how to get there. Um, but that's where nutmeg first was discovered. Um, and through trade and through smuggling, nutmeg expanded to grow in other parts of the world that unsurprisingly had similar climates. So these are just sort of the, probably the four main areas where nutmeg still grows and is harvested today. Um, still in Indonesia, about 40% of the world's nutmeg actually comes out of Grenada, or Grenada. <laughs> There'll be more cocktails, so that one will continue to be funny. <laughs> Or if it's not, there'll just be more cocktails. Um, <laughs> Malaysia and, and India. So we can start to get an idea of the type of, of belt of the world where nutmeg will grow. And it's all to do, of course, with the terroir and the type of climate, particularly the rainfall that's needed. If you can remember the image of that tree, it's quite big and lush and green. So obviously, rainfall is important. Um, also, unsurprisingly, what nutmeg needs to grow, like many other natural products, is a continued interest in farming. And this is something that we saw in Grenada um, as a potential challenge, because of course, as the millennial generation come through and people's aspirations change and people want to travel and go into more technologically advanced industries, without the farmers to keep these old practices of simply farming and producing nutmeg, we could run into shortages of supply or rising prices. Um, so that's something that just to sort of keep in mind. Um, time as well, much like an agave plant, you can't just plant it and, and reap the benefits. You've got to wait a little bit because it takes a few years to come to um, fruition, to maturation, to bear the fruit. So where nutmeg grows now, like I said, we're going to focus on this island in the Caribbean, <laughs> which is quite close to uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Beautiful island, very natural, relatively unspoilt for that part of the world. Uh, known as the Spice Island, this is the flag of Grenada. And you'll see on the left-hand side, they actually have a nutmeg on their flag. This is how dedicated they are and how important nutmeg is to Grenada. At first, I thought it was a cute little mm -hmm. candle. <laughs> and then I did my research on nutmeg and uh, how it grows. So you can see that peach like that yellow fruit and then that bright red mace arrow case that comes on the nutmeg. Um, so the spice island it's known as. And, and really Grenada was the first island in the Caribbean that nutmeg arrived to to be planted and used as a base. It's not indigenous to Grenada. So this, uh, this little nutmeg is telling us how his or her grandparents were smuggled there in, in the 1800s. And this is where we start to see uh, nutmeg growing in the island. Uh, growing seasons, because of Grenada's beautiful year-round climate, um, as I said before, nutmeg is kind of a, an, it's an annual, it's just a continuous um, harvest. There's no particular period. So there's a nice, steady, consistent flow, which when an, a country or a nation is relying on this for their a lot of their economy is also a, a good and stable thing. So no surprise then, I think you get in the picture, nutmeg is a major export from Grenada. In fact, it's their number one export. Um, when we were down there, we heard a lot about this idea of supporting the farmers. Uh, there's the Nutmeg Association, which uh, received Peter and I in Grenada and actually took us around um, to show us there were <laughs> equal parts surprised and delighted that somebody <laughs> actually went to Grenada to, to research nutmeg. To <laughs> they thought it maybe was a joke or some kind of scam, but we assured them it was legit. So they took us around their processing plant and uh, answered lots of questions, but said, you know, yeah, it's important. We are trying to support the farmers and encourage this, that these practices stay so that they can get a good and consistent supply um, of nutmeg. And breaking news straight from Grenada this summer is they're actually working to establish a geographical denomination for Gren Gren <coughs> Grenadian. Grenadian nutmeg. Grenadian nutmeg. Grenadian nutmeg. Grenadian. Nutmeg from Grenada. <laughs> um, so there we were, excited to be in Grenada, the Spice Island, the home of nutmeg. Everything's nutmeg. You get to the airport and there's, you know, welcome to the Spice Island, big images of nutmeg at the airport. Well, yeah, we couldn't be more excited. So we thought, wow, we're going to un uncover all of these other uses for nutmeg here in Grenada. So the first person we asked, you know, 
what else do you use nutmeg for? And as we checked into the hotel, around the bases of the trees, they actually had old nutmeg shells. Um, so we're super excited taking photographs. Great, one thing on the list. And then we asked the next person um, at lunch, you know, what else do you use nutmeg for? Uh, bacon and, and drinks. Great, like we do back home. <laughs> And that was really as far as we got. So <laughs> unsurprisingly, there aren't too many other uses. Uh, when we went to the Everything Nutmeg gift store, <laughs> we found that they were a little bit more um, ingenious with their offerings. There were some nutmeg candles and soaps and candied jellies. nutmeg fruit and jellies and jams. Coffee. Um, coffee, yeah. That's true. And ice cream. Yeah. There were some others. So nutmeg has a little more reach than you might think. <laughs> Um, so we went then to the processing plant, and this is in the heart of uh, Grenada. And this is really how mm. nutmeg is collected. So it comes in from the farms in these sacks, like I said, collected twice a week from plantations all over the island. And there's not really much difference of terroir. They kind of consider all of Grenada to be the same terroir, even though it's quite mountainous. That didn't really seem to affect it too much. So it's all considered sort of one type. Um, what was really cool, was when they get the nutmeg in, the first thing they do is they put it into a giant bath of water. And what happens is most of the nutmegs sink to the bottom, right? Because they, they, they have weight to them. But some of them actually float. And what that means is they're hollow, either partially or fully hollow inside. So these ones are taken to the side, and they're actually sort of crushed up and used for ground nutmeg product that you might buy in the stores versus kept for whole nutmeg. So they kind of weasel out the, the, the cheetahs, if you will, the hollow nutmegs, and use those for sort of byproducts. That was news to us, so we thought that was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so then they sort them out. They, they then rack them out, much like floor malting, if anyone knows um, <coughs> malting barley and single malt scotch production. It reminded me of that. Yep. They'll lay them out just to dry after they've done the, the wetting process. Um, and then they put them into sacks. So what they've done is they've kind of um, ascertained the content and the quality of the nutmeg and taken away any that are better for ground nutmeg um, use. And then mace is handled in a slightly different way. So they'll collect the, the shells, the mace blades, and they'll keep those separate, of course, so that they can be you know, packaged like so, like the emperor's mace blade from Rare Tea Cellar. If you see Rod from Rare Tea, be sure to ask him what emperor um, signifies here. Which emperor? Which emperor, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, other parts of the nutmeg then. We mentioned some of these already. The mace blades, the broken shells that we get from the processing production. Um, the little knobs at the end of grating. So we've got some bartenders in the room, I imagine. Yep, OK. Just making sure we're at the right conference. <laughs> Um, so you know how you, you go through your nutmeg and you're grating away and then you get down to that end bit and, yep, your fingers are getting in the way, right? So you're always kind of left with those little knobs. Um, so, you know, what to do with those? Jack, what do you do with those at the, uh, the Dead Rabbit? You so, mentioned this. Yeah, we uh, blend the knobs uh, that are left over into a fine powder and then we would make a nutmeg cane syrup um, out of the knobs um, so we can use those in salt and sours, fizzes. Uh, sometimes in a teaspoon for a, a stir drink, um, just to give that nuance, the, the nutmeg nuance. So, yeah, that's what we yeah. do. Yeah, see? So there we've just saved you a little bit of wastage at your bar. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, interestingly, there was something called nutmeg. Uh, Peter, do you want to tell the nice people about nutmeg? Uh, yeah, sure, give it to the old guy. The uh, nutmeg <laughs> is for uh, joint uh, and muscle aches. Uh, a little bit of uh, menthol in here as well. Feel free to come up and use it um, if you'd like, uh, but it's here for your, yeah, so your good joint for, pleasure. Good for arthritis, and it has nothing to do with mace, spray, nutmeg. <laughs> it's not it's that not kind spray, of, no. yeah, it's, it's good for you. Good. Um, just in a little bit then, we'll have the second cocktail come out, um, and this one is called the Army and Navy, which is a, an old kind of, Random classic. Has anyone heard of the Army and Navy before? Okay, a good amount of you. Good. So this is like an old uh, gin cocktail. Gin, orgeat, and fresh lime juice, grated with, uh, with uh, garnished with freshly grated nutmeg on top. So what we're going to do for you today is serve the Army and Navy without the garnish, 
and then we're going to pepper around. I was a poor use of words, wasn't it? <laughs> we're going to supply you some, some freshly grated nutmeg on the side. And the whole idea here is we'd like you to sip the cocktail first and then add the nutmeg and then taste it again. Um, and what you should hopefully find on the second taste is with that aroma of nutmeg, you should it should taste different. Um, and this is also a great drink with rum or spiced rum because the nutmeg clearly ties it all in together. But it's perhaps even more uh, interesting to do with gin because you wouldn't normally associate nutmeg with gin. Um, but you've got that delicate spice that you get from juniper berry, caraway seed, cubeb, those kind of more spice-driven ingredients in some gins, particularly Hendrix on this occasion, that the nutmeg will actually draw out. So, you know, one idea is using nutmeg with slightly more delicate flavors, as long as the proportions are good, can actually help to draw out different characters. And you might get different notes from your gin and gin cocktails using nutmeg than the more traditional citrus or floral notes or cucumber that we usually enjoy with uh, gin cocktails. Uh, so when that cocktail comes around, be sure to give it a taste and then a little sprinkle and another taste. Um, and we can take any comments if you have them when that drink gets here. It'll be here soon. <laughs> It'll be here soon. <laughs> OK. So with that, I'm going to pass the uh, clicker on to Peter. And uh, you're going to go through some yes. uses and, and historical references of nutmeg. Do you mind if I no, switch you... places here? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now that uh, Charlotte has brought you to the brink of excitement here, <laughs> to the very edges, um, we're going to get into a little bit of the darker history of nutmeg. Um, you know, this, th this fascinated me. Uh, obviously, last year we did mint, and you know we started thinking more about garnishes and, and what garnish has been around for so long. Um, from the very beginning, like Charlotte said, uh, nutmeg with punch, but you still see it today very much in tiki drinks. And why has this sustained in our cocktail culture? And, and why has this um, uh, why has this spice been so important to so many people for so long? Um, first of all, we get you know a very positive reaction to smelling nutmeg. I know everyone's, I can see everyone laughing and smiling in here, and hopefully it's not just the drinking or, or presentation, but I, I did gently scent the room with nutmeg this morning, so hopefully that's elevated your mood a little bit. Um, but today we use it more of a, as a seasoning. You know, previously uh, a lot of culinary uses for nutmeg were more of a condiment. It was put into jams and jellies and, and paste uh, and so forth, but now we, we typically, as we saw in Grenada, uh, even in that country, we typically just use it for seasoning. Uh, in Indian and Asian cuisines, we see it in a lot of, a lot of curries, uh, especially masaman curry. Uh, the Dutch use it a lot on vegetables, uh, especially green vegetables. Uh, throughout Europe, you'll see it on potato dishes. Uh, in the Caribbean, you do use it in uh, a lot of um, almost curried or stewed chicken dishes. Throughout uh, Europe, I said that. Um, cheese sauces, bechamel, uh, being a very famous uh, sauce that uh, incorporates nutmeg. And today, more of the holiday season. It, it, you know, when you smell nutmeg, when you smell cinnamon, all these holiday spices, they're ho called holiday spices for a reason. You know, you see them more around the holiday season, and we see them in pies, breads, uh, cakes, and holiday sweets. Uh, but generally, when you smell nutmeg, we do have that positive lightning reaction to it. Um, so what do we typically use nutmeg for? Why did, why did people want nutmeg? Um, you know, stomach ailments, we say this a lot when we talk about amari or bitters. It seems like everyone was trying to always cure some sort of stomach ailment, and nutmeg was one of those as well. It did cure stomach ailments. Uh, the Chinese and Greeks both found this a warming spice. The Chinese, uh, as a yang, it warmed the body. The Greeks, uh, they had four different humors um, in traditional medicine. <laughs> always comes back Is to that the Greeks. One of them? Huh? <laughs> um, so melancholy, the black bile, was uh, one that was they, they were always trying to cure because this. Um, a lot of different ailments came out of black bile or melancholy. So nutmeg warmed the body and had, kind of prevented uh, this humor. Uh, William Salmon, a 17th century Englishman, writing in 1693, uh, described an experiment where he rubbed nutmeg on his genitals and produced a positive reaction. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I, want to think, I want you to think about this next one uh, around Valentine's Day or on Tuesdays, if any of you host a Tinder Tuesday at your bar. 
Uh, there's a German folklore tradition of where if a woman is enamored by a gentleman, she will swallow a whole nutmeg, and once passing it whole, will then take that nutmeg and grind it over his food, and then he will fall in love with her. Wow, what a challenge. <laughs> I know it's only Wednesday, but come Saturday, you're going to be thinking about it. <laughs> um, actually, and uh, more importantly, the sweating sickness, uh, also known as body flux, the black plague. Uh, it was said that you were merry at dinner and dead at supper. This, uh, this, the plague, of course, killed very quickly. We know how many people the, the plague killed. Um, but one thing that was a cure for nutmeg was, was a cure for the plague was nutmeg. Interestingly enough, this coincided when uh, nutmeg imports actually heightened throughout Europe, and prices obviously would start to fall a little bit as nutmeg um, becomes more available. So one way to raise the prices was to say, well, it's going to cure your plague, and if you don't take it real fast, you're going to die. Uh, so those are the traditional uses for, for nutmeg. Today, we, there is a lot of research on nutmeg. Uh, we know it does detoxify the body, it cleans out the liver and the kidneys, uh, brain health, it uh, reduces um, the degradation of um, neural pathways, so it, uh, it does aid with uh, anyone that has Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, of course, it still helps with digestive health. Um, by, it helps by, um, when you take it with other foods, it helps you intake or digest other minerals from those foods, so it makes digestion a little bit faster. Uh, sleep, it contains magnesium, uh, which re relaxes the muscles and also helps the body to release its serotonin. Oral health, it's um, natural uh, bacteria, so it kills halitosis. It's great for gum health. Uh, insomnia, um, I think I have that twice. Look at that. It's, it does <laughs> double duty. Uh, skin care, uh, reduces inflammation and promotes hydration. And blood pressure, uh, it opens up the blood vessels. And uh, for both bone health, it contains a lot of uh, calcium, actually. But here's your warning before you go out and start sprinkling nutmeg on everything. Uh, it is a hallucinogenic. Uh, one reason we don't make a lot of uh, nutmeg syrups. <laughs> it's described as somewhere, and I'm sure you've all been in the state of somewhere between drunk and high. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, this, is, this is the kind of the state it puts you in, uh, but too much of this will be a, a, a toxin to the body. Um, it causes seizures, irregular heart palpitations, vomiting, and nausea. Um, and it doesn't take that much. It's about three to four milligrams per pound of body weight. So talking a low dosage would be about one teaspoon, uh, high dosage would be two tablespoons. Uh, so be careful. It's, it's, you know, it's a consideration like when we make um, tonic syrups with a level of quinine. Before you make a nutmeg syrup, start thinking about uh, adverse effects that you can have on your guests. So a little bit does go a long way. Obviously, the fresher the nutmeg is, uh, the more potent it is. So using nut, uh, fresh nutmeg allows you to use less of it and hopefully not hurt anyone. Unless you're looking for a good time. Also, the other thing about nutmeg is this high takes a very long time to take effect, about 12 hours. So what a lot of people do is they want to feel the effects of this, and they'll start taking it. They don't feel it. They'll take more, they'll take more, they'll take more. And then 12 hours later, they've taken so much that they've uh, seriously harmed themselves. And thank you for experimenting and doing the research. Yes, right. Um, we appreciate it. Started last night. I'm doing great. Um, so how did we... <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, so how did nutmeg come into Europe? Well. Uh, the Europeans used to get it through the Venetians, who then got it through Constantinople. Um, but beyond that, really, they didn't know where it came from. The Venetians were, wanted to protect this um, import and export as it was a valuable commodity, so they weren't going to tell anyone where it came from. Um, the, the people from Constantinople would say that you know, it was from this very far away island. You couldn't uh, get there. It was hard to get there. It was, um, any ship that tried to get near the island would just be crashed into these reefs. Uh, there was a giant sea serpent that protected the island, and once you got onto the island, it was full of headhunters. So don't even try and get there. And they actually weren't too far off, as we'll see. Uh, a journey to the Bend Islands from Europe would take three to six months, and that was around uh, the Horn of Africa and up and through Indonesia. And the key players in the story are going to be Portugal, Spain, and then England and Holland. And one reason they wanted to get there was it was a 60,000% uh, markup on each nutmeg. 60,000%. You could buy a sack for just pennies and sell it for a huge amount of money 
in England. I mean, just a small amount was enough to set you up for life. Um, and a lot of these sailors would actually go on these trips unpaid with the idea that they were just going to steal a little bit of nutmeg once they were there, and all they needed was a few nutmeg, and they'd be set for life. And the dock workers that had to unload it in England would literally be given these burlap suits that had no pockets in them, so they're, and they'd be inspected, so there's no way they could steal any nutmeg. Um, and <laughs> so going back to German tradition. <laughs> um, this is uh, early 1600s. Um, and as Charlotte said, th this was worth more than gold, literally worth more than gold. This was enough to run the empires of England and, and Holland, and this is really why they wanted to get to these, these tiny little islands. So how do we get to these islands? You know, again, this passage takes three to six months, so people start thinking about other ways to get there. And one of the more curious ways uh, we read about was this Northwest Passage. And people would look at these maps of, interestingly enough, one person that came up with this theory was Mercator, the gentleman that came up with the Mercator proje projection map. And he was looking at the map and saying, look, the top of, the top of Norway kind of looks like the bottom of Africa. I think it's the same spot. So if we just go north, we can get to the Spice Islands real fast. Um, so for many years, about 50 years, people were trying to get to the Spice Islands through this Northwest Passage. And they're encouraged because they'd see ice blocks. And of course, salt water doesn't freeze. So there must be fresh water coming out of there. The Spice Islands are full of fresh water. They'd find these horns that were actually nar narwhal horns. And they didn't know what a narwhal was. But they did know what a unicorn was. And where do unicorns come from? They come from Asia. So <laughs> we must be on the right path. Um, so several ships were sent up to the Northwest Passage. And they all froze to death. Um, then we tried a northeast passage, same way, didn't work. Uh, and then if that didn't work, we were going to go east. So Columbus in 1492 was actually searching for the Spice Islands. Uh, we know where he landed. Uh, Fernand Magellan in 1518 was searching for the Spice Islands. Uh, he didn't make it away all the way around the world. Uh, as we know, he died in the um, Philippines. But his uh, crew did make it around the world. Uh, Francis Drake was the first one in 1577 to actually um, go east and hit the Spice Islands. Uh, that was the first successful mission from England. And the an interesting one is 1609, Henry Hudson. Um, he was actually contracted, uh, he was an Englishman working for the Dutch. He was contracted to still try and find this Northwest Passage. And interestingly enough, he, he took a very low sum of money. And researching this, it was such a low sum of money that it was almost weird that he didn't want a lot of money to take this dangerous journey. So as soon as he sets off, he goes up a little bit towards Norway and then turns around and he heads straight east because he's convinced that he can get to the Spice Islands going through America. He's convinced if he lands around Maryland um, that he's going to find a river that takes him right through the country. And he doesn't. So he's kind of stuck there for a little while, and he wanders up the coast, and he ends up in this area, which is now the Hudson River. And he lands in uh, sort of where the World Trade Center area would be right now in New York. And he finds it very fertile land. You know, it's great for farming, the best he's ever seen. There's a lot of trading. There's a lot of pelts. There's a lot of animals out there. And he says, look, I think I, th I found something better than the Spice Islands. He goes back to the Dutch. They're not too happy because they wanted to find spice. But he says, all right, I'll give you this little piece of land. We'll call it New Amsterdam or New Netherlands. Um, we'll just leave it over here for a little while. So um, now we have the fight for the control of the Band Islands. Uh, Portuguese are really the first Europeans to successfully get there. Um, but they actually saw how dangerous it was, and they didn't want to take control of the islands. They didn't want to fight. So they preferred to trade with the, the locals instead of taking occupation. Of course, the challenges were the natives were very restless. You know, they, they, wanted, uh, they didn't take well to these people coming to their islands, and they did kill a lot of them. The, the, the reefs were very dangerous around the islands. The ships would crash into them. Many would sink. Um, and in 1591, the English decided that they were going to get into the game, and they started what, were the, what was the beginning of the East India Trading Company. And they sent two journeys. Uh, one was uh, James Lancaster. This was a complete failure. Three ships went out. Uh, only one came back. Of 200 men that left, only 25 came back. And the ships came back empty. Uh, and the only thing the men had were scurvy. So uh, the English were out of it for a little while. They gave it a try again 20 years later, exactly. They sent James Lancaster again, uh, who this time came back very successful. All the ships came back. All the ships came back full of nutmeg. Um, and they were really in the game at this point. Uh, next, they send out a gentleman called, named William Keeling, uh, who really takes control of this area and set up, sets up trading posts. Um, 
for the next 20 years over there. And there's an interesting book called uh, Nathaniel's Nutmeg that uh, Charlotte and I read. And it's great for insomnia. It's, <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're an academic, if you, if you like to take notes and margins, this might be a book for you. It's, it's a thick read. It's, um, That's good for it's a, it's a <laughs> Essentially, what, the, what you need to remember from this book is for 20 years, it's really a protracted war between the Dutch and the English. Uh, going back and forth for control of these islands. And it, it's, it's a very bloody, bloody um, fight. The English prefer to befriend the islanders. Um, you know, everyone's got these documents showing that uh, different islands have pledged their allegiance to the, the queen or king of, Sp of uh, England, um, and they try and make allegiances this way. The Dutch take a completely different uh, 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 path to this. They decide they're just going to kill everyone and anything in the path. Um, and not just kill, torture. Uh, they would round, anyone, round up anyone they could find, torture them, and kill them. This uh, included uh, Portuguese, English, Spanish, uh, but especially the islanders. They didn't want any sort of uh, negotiating. They just wanted full control of the islands. And as a result, uh, the Dutch really do control these islands for most of the time. Um, let me go back down here. This bottom slide, these are the bandas over here. Mm -hmm. And this is the central clump of islands that are mostly under control. But if you see in the bottom left over there is an island called Run, R-U-N, Run. And this is really the one that's hardest to control. Uh, it's uh, because of the currents, because of the logistics, uh, the topography of the island, it's very hard to get a hold of. So while the Dutch remained in control of the, the big clump of the islands, that small one of Run went back and forth um, over the years. Eventually, the English gained can, can control of it. Um, the Dutch, of course, are not too happy, so that island goes back and forth. And in 1619, oddly enough, because as you can imagine, you can't just send an email and say, hey, I captured this island. It takes a while to get back to the English or the Dutch. The Dutch are tired of this fighting. And um, this gentleman, Jan Cohen, had captured the island run for the Dutch. So now the Dutch had complete control of the island uh, and all the nutmeg trade. But the English and Dutch said, hey, back in England and, and Holland said, hey, we're, we're tired of fighting. Let's sign a treaty and it was the Treaty of Defense in 1619, and that said the Dutch have two-thirds of the islands, the English have one-third, and they're going to share defense of the island against the Portuguese. Uh, of course, Jan, who had been fighting for years and killing as many people as he could possibly come across, wasn't too happy of this, so he kind of ignored the treaty and went ahead and recaptured the island of Run. So what are the outcomes of this? Um, well, King Charles's brother, James, Duke of York, is pretty upset about this. Uh, with Jan Cohen going against the treaty. So he goes out to capture all of Holland's outposts in Africa and then also in the New World. So he sends out um, a fleet to uh, New Amsterdam or New Netherlands and kind of takes over that. And again, they go back to the treaty, to the drawing boards and negotiating table and say, look, all right, we're tired of all this fighting. How about Holland keeps the island a run? and the English are to keep New Amsterdam or New Holland, which now is Manhattan. So really, uh, nutmeg plays a big part in how um, uh, Manhattan was handed over to the English and plays into our history. Uh, the East India Company uh, grows stronger and, of course, uh, lives on for another couple hundred years. Uh, but with anything, we have the decline of the, the, this trade route. Um, the English obviously just pulled up the nutmeg plants and moved them other places throughout the Indian Ocean and then into the Caribbean. Uh, so, of course, there wasn't a need to go into the Bandas. Uh, in the late 1700s, there was, these islands are volcanic. There was a great period of volcanic activity. Uh, tidal waves, earthquakes pretty much decimated the islands and all the plants on them. Um, the Dutch trading company folds uh, in bankruptcy, and it was just too costly for anyone to go to these islands anymore. Uh, today, you can still get to these islands. Uh, through ferry. Um, you can still get to run. It it's a 12-hour ferry ride. There are no planes that go to the island. Um, but these have, uh, except in 1944 when the Japanese took control of one of the islands uh, as an outpost for World War II, really there's been no history or, or no interest in these islands uh, in the last 300 years. Uh, so again, this really, you know, this, this is kind of is the crux of why we were interested in this, this seminar is, you know, we talk about 
you know, everyone's mezcal crazy, and we talk about uh, the Spaniards coming to Spain and clandestine distilling with mezcal and how it's pulled into these little villages. And same thing with Scottish, uh, with Scotch production, how that distilling was very clandestine. And we talk about American whiskey production and uh, how the whiskey rebellion played into that and how we started moving west and how, how bourbon develops and that. You know, when we drink, when we have cocktails, we are really drinking history. And I think one of these overlooked pieces of history is this tiny little nutmeg that you, know, you can buy from your food purveyor and you don't think much of it anymore. It just costs a few bucks for a, for a big uh, pound of this, is how I buy it. Um, but to really think that this was worth more than its weight in gold and really ran empires for so long. Uh, it's kind of fascinating when you, when you start putting on a cocktail. So hopefully that'll inspire some cocktail names or uh, again, Tinder Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jack to talk about uh, how we make America great again. Yes. Um, so yeah, did you want to talk a little bit about the vintage grinders? Yes, yeah, so obviously with our work at Dead Rabbit, um, particularly at the uh, onset of the program, the first program that we did, we really uh, heavily researched drinks from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, um, some of which we're going to talk about uh, down a bit further about down the line. But one of the pre kind of prerequisite ingredients in a lot of these drinks would have been punch. Um, and when we came to like research this, the main person that you have to talk to is Dave Wondridge, um, as with everything um, <laughs> historic. So he basically said there were gentlemen's accessories in the late 18th century, little silver things you carried in your I'll just put it up in your pocket. If you wanted nutmeg in your punch, you would grate, grate it on yourself. So these guys would have had this, uh, like if you see here, they, they would have had these type of things and they also would have wore them as necklaces. They would have had them in their pockets. Um, and pulling this out would have been like a sign of like you were rich and you were, you were well to do. Um, but as Dave goes on to say, cheaper ones were made with wood with a metal insert in the late 19th, 19th century and pressed tin ones, which are even cheaper still, arrived in the later 19th century. So it kind of, ties in perfectly when punch started to kind of fall off the cliff of the Kingdom of Mixed Drinks because it ruled uh, the Kingdom of Mixed Drinks from the kind of late, mid 1600s right through the 1850s. Um, but what Cohen said, like it was the Americanization, urbanization, industrialization. Basically, Americans didn't want to be seen to have time to spend around a punch bowl for two hours um, because it was the birth of the American minute. Everybody wanted drinks right away. Um, and individual drinks and this ties in perfectly with the demise of nutmeg as well because nutmeg towards the late uh, 19th century became more of a uh, widely used ingredient because you have the cheaper vessels um, and it was, it was just better, it was just more available. Um, so nutmeg at a bar, um, this is basically just to do with like modern gr uh, grinders um, versus like any, like there's quite a few different uh, type of, of grinders. You've got grinders that are like quite like a pepper mill grinder. Um, you've got grinders that would be quite similar to this guy, the microplate. Um, so this would be the one that we, obviously not this big, but this would be the one that we would use quite a lot of dead rabbit. Um, yes, that's, that would be the perfect size. So like you don't want this behind your bar. Um, this is the perfect size. Um, you'll also have ones that are very, very small. Um, and hard to use, so generally something this size, um, and there's also a steel version of this are quite good um, in terms of getting the most out of your nutmeg. Now you won't get right down because when you get right down, as my not so beautiful hands can uh, testify, they, they start to like cut your hands. Um, so you don't you don't want to gr uh, garnish a drink with skin. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good idea. Let it um, so it's extra. <laughs> this one's pretty good. The thing with there's the, also the other style is the pepper grinders. Um, but the issues I have with the pepper grinders that you get too much of a it's it's not coarse enough. It's more like clumpy. Um, so when you're talking about like like when we serve uh, our drinks, we want it to be the texture is extremely important. So you want a really fine layer of uh, ice crystals. Um, that kind of like melt in your mouth, um, but also the garnish. The garnish has to be played perfectly in that, so the nutmeg has to be very, very uh, coarse and not big like clumps of getting your teeth and all that type of stuff. Um, working with nutmeg behind the bar, this is what my big like kind of session moment, if you will. Uh, fresh is always best. Um, if you have pre-grated nutmeg in your bar, you need to get rid of it. That's not good. Um, really, really not good. Um, it's just more. It's more of a, I don't know what you guys think, but it's more of like a medicinal, like it's, 
it's not like a real flavour that, that you get from it. And it tend, when you open the packet, the freshness goes very, very quickly. Um, For me, nutmeg always has um, it's like a combination of allspice, uh, orange, mm -hmm. and almost like an anise quality, yes. that menthol quality. But yeah, sure. with the um, packaged one, that menthol, yeah. anise really comes through a lot. So we would always, we would always advocate using fresh nutmeg um, the, and then storing it correctly as well. So we have the small uh, jars that you seal at the end of the night. But again, it's, it's a, it's a, it should be treated as a legitimate ingredient um, and stored so. Uh, tip, different types of nutmeg. Uh, Use were talking Grenada, Grenada. Um, that's one area. Um, but we two at uh, Dead Rabbit use Indonesian uh, nutmeg. Um, now, in regards to the different types, this one I find slightly more floral um, than the, the one that we have at Dead Rabbit would be much more savory. And the reason behind that is that we use, uh, you're going to see some of our drinks in a minute, but we would use nutmeg like a lot. Um, so, <laughs> like a lot, a lot. Um, and those are still the two main sources of nutmeg. You can source them Indonesian or Caribbean or Grenadian uh, nutmeg. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would use it in quite like a lot of like cream style drinks, a lot of drinks with egg white. Um, a lot, the, across the range we would use it, but the one we would go for would be definitely Indonesia. Um, and then moving on now into some of the drinks. Traditionally speaking, as we said, when we were doing our research, the prerequisite for a lot of these styles, uh, like in terms of a garnish punch, was heavily nutmegged. Um, milk punch is the same, sangaree, uh, definitely tiki was kind of like the last, I'd say like the last, like the way the Irish coffee, the tro it was a kind of the Trojan horse for Irish whiskey, like the last kind of horse out of town. So the tiki era would have been that way for, for nutmeg because after tiki, uh, the tiki era kind of dissipated. Nutmeg really fell into the doldrums a bit. It wasn't really uh, used a lot in, uh, in cocktails so much so that like it would have kind of been just for the, the toddy um, if you weren't well or something like that. Um, but when we came to open the Dead Rabbit, a lot of people like when they came in, and all we had at our first bar was lemon twists, uh, orange twists, I think a grapefruit twist would have been extravagant, and nutmeg. Uh, that would have been our garnishes because that, that's the way it was back in the day. There wasn't these like big but, like garnishes everywhere. Um, and I just don't believe in a, yeah, no, mint, mint wouldn't have been a big, a big uh, garnish back then also. Would have, would have? I'm <laughs> kidding. No. It wasn't? Okay. Because I know these guys done a nutmeg or a mint <laughs> one last year. Um, so yeah, and then hot drinks and hot toddies, as we said, it would have been big in and, and eggnog. But you'll see with the, most of these drinks, these good drinks have all gone in the past kind of 20 or 30 years. Now you're starting to see them come back with, with theme bars and stuff like that. And obviously Dead Rabbit uh, pays perfectly into that. Um, but there's three different bars that we're involved in. Um, and all three use quite a lot of nutmeg. Um, so I took, I took a few drinks out of each program just to illustrate how we use it. Um, and this is a drink that we serve in uh, Chicago. Uh, we have a project there called Green River. Um, so this, this drink is all it's basically a, a sour, um, but an, instead of having egg white, we wanted to use a, a cheese. Um, and I know that sounds probably weird to a lot of people, um, but it really it, it comes out beautifully well. Um, so it, it's uh, here for Andy 1840. You have a bit of Kirsch in there. Creme de Noyo would be uh, a quite prevalent ingredient in 19th century uh, mixology and it's basically as uh, Charlotte was talking about peaches and then you would have the peach and you threw away the the, the kernel or, or an apricot. Back in the day they didn't do that they would have they would have taken these kernels ma and like macerated them in brandy and it would have resulted in a creme de noyau so it's like a much lighter style of amaretto um, and it's quite it's quite a pungent taste but it worked really well in this drink with some uh, vanilla lemon and a uh, mascarpone cheese um, which I know it's a bit weird, but it's a, it's a really good drink. Um, but the thing that happened on the top, like the cheese really came through on the, like a, on, the, on the nose. So anytime there's like an off putting uh, nose, we would always finish it with nutmeg. Um, because nutmeg to me is like a, it's a very enticing uh, no, like nose, it's very welcoming. Um, and you can see here, we're ho hopefully we're not going into the toxicity <laughs> levels, but there's quite quite a lot of it used here. Um, so we'll have to look at that when we get back. Um, and this is the Alexander. So this is from uh, we're opening up a new bar in uh, August called Blacktail, um, and it basically celebrates. Sorry, this is a shameless plug. Um, this basically celebrates the kind of the American bar and how that traveled to uh, Havana during the 1920s and 1950s. So it's not a Cuban bar, um, it's the American bar with like a Cuban soul. Um, so a lot of the drinks, again, the narrative that we focused on 
uh, with this was definitely from 1920s and 1950s cocktail books. And there was quite a lot of use of nutmeg in there. And one of the most iconic uses would have been the Alexander. Um, so that's one of the drinks that we use here. Um, again, our philosophy at Dead Rabbit is to take the core of what a classic cocktail is and then change it until, it, until it's like a fantastic drink, in, in our opinion. Um, and the reason why we obviously use nutmeg uh, here is cream has like, it has a, it's fantastic texture, texture reasons, but sometimes like, it leaves a note that's quite similar to like using egg whites um, in a drink. It gives like that wet dog kind of, it, it doesn't leave a great flavor. So we would use nutmeg uh, exclusively in drinks like this. And then this drink's called the Total Diva, um, <laughs> which is uh, befitting. Um, so this is essentially our riff on a pina colada. Um, so we've got a bit of kefir in there for brightness. Um, you've got matcha green tea infused coco lopez. Um, and the reason for that is if you were to use matcha tea, like a teaspoon in a, in a cocktail or a half a teaspoon, it tends to get quite gritty. Um, so we've infused it in, a, in the coco lopez. And then we've got lime orgeat, which is normal liqueur. Um, fennel syrup, half and half, and Citadel gin. So this was actually a riff on the Army and Navy, which you got before. Mm -hmm. um, but it's much brighter. Um, and again, you can see the cream in here. So anytime we use cream, we would generally use uh, nutmeg. Um, so that's the, the total diva. And then it's not just used for garnish. Um, so another thing that we just uh, spoke to you about was when we get the nutmeg, we can only get the nutmegs down to about a third of the size before we have to stop using it. So what we'll do then is our, we have a prep guy who will take all the leftover nutmeg, he'll blitz it all, um, and then he'll turn it into a, a nutmeg cane syrup, not dissimilar to the one that's just sitting right in front of us. Um, so we will use that in stirred drinks, um, and like old fashions and that type of stuff. So this is called a flashback that is on our current menu. So this is created by uh, Great Buddha. And this is essentially, uh, it's Manhattan style. Um, so he has black straps, cinnamon, uh, nutmeg cane syrup, and our El Dorado dark rum, which is a very uh, forward, it's like, a, like quite a molasses driven rum, a Marona Nino, Banal, and uh, Crown Royal Rye. Um, so again, it kind of plays off those kind of prerequisite Christmas spices. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what we do with that drink. And then the coronation, so this plays into egg white um, because we aren't really huge. I know like, what was it, like five years ago, everybody was using egg white. Um, it was a big thing, but egg white really isn't something that I enjoy um, because of that, the wet dog flavor that you get off of it. Um, so anytime we serve egg white drinks, we, we tr generally try to use a twist um, to kind of mask that wet dog flavor that you get. Or uh, I know that sounds gross, but it's, this, it's, what, it's what we get from it. Um, or we'll use nutmeg. And something that we actually done in The Merchant, which was stolen from Tony C, is uh, when, you get a, when you get eggs, they come in a Tupperware. Um, so what we done, we got the nutmeg and made a, a hydrosol. Um, through a rotary evaporator, um, and then what we done with that was we sprayed. So it's like it was a water, it was a water flavored nutmeg, and we sprayed that into the Tupperware. And through because uh, eggs are porous, um, there's a sand sand term called osmosis. So it went from the tup Tupperware into the eggs, and then when you use that egg in a cocktail, it, it left a nuance of nutmeg instead of uh, instead of that wet dog flavor. Um, but it's it's too it's too it's too much. Craziness, so we, we didn't use it, uh, but that's that's what we done. That's, a t that's how much we love nutmeg. Um, and then the pineapple milk is a drink that's on the blacktail menu. So this is a uh, drink that was documented by Charles H. Baker, um, and his and his exploits traveling all over the world. Um, and his one would have had pineapple, vanilla, uh, cream, and uh, Spanish brandy. But you can see we've kind of changed that up a bit with uh, tonka bean instead of uh, vanilla, um, which is also quite toxic as well. Um, so we use that, we've done our research on that to make sure that it's okay. Um, but we also finish this off with uh, a light dusting that you can see it's quite light, um, where some of our other drinks would be heavier. Um, so we, we monitor, like when we have these to our staff, it's a light, it's a light dust, like almost like charn. It's a light dust, a medium dust, or a heavy dust. Um, so that the staff know what way to do it. Um, and then this is a flip, so a flip would have been the kind of iconic drink that would have uh, had, had nutmeg. All most flips from uh, from like the 19th century would have employed employed nutmeg, and this is just our riff on it. So this is a very rich uh, flip with uh, banana, port. You've got maple, uh, our house bitters, and then Bushmills Black Bush. It's it's a sherry driven uh, matured rum, and then High West uh, Silver Oat, and then it's just finished with a bit of nutmeg, obviously. Um, and then the last one, the Do Mr. Dooley is quite similar to the Coronation. 
But the last one, uh, which is quite, uh, this has only happened in the past few years, and this is me arguing with, with uh, De La Groff, who's King Cocktail. Um, because the Irish coffee we started off with was inspired by De La Groff. De La Groff done a seminar in London about eight or nine years ago. Um, and he said the Irish coffee was the most bastardized drink. Like it was, nobody could make it right. It was too much coffee. It was espresso coffee. It was whipped cream. It was uh, like cinnamon stuff on it. It was just, it was a complete abomination. Um, but when the Irish coffee actually started out, there was a guy in, uh, well, so the story goes, there was a guy in, a, in, a, in an airport in Ireland who, who made the, the first Irish coffee and then it was stumbled upon by uh, Stanton Dallaplane, who was a San Francisco Chronicle writer. And he fell in love with the drink, um, but he seen that there was improvements to be made in it. So what he done is he took that idea, brought it over to San Francisco, and worked with the Bonavista, uh, the, Bo the Bonavista to get that drink better. And it was like the, the mayor was involved because of his dairy contacts. It was a whole big thing. Um, but what resulted in was this, like the Bonavista Irish coffee glass, which is perfectly portioned for for an ounce and a quarter. Um, of Irish whiskey, you've got about four ounces of filtered, good quality filtered coffee, um, half an ounce of, of, a, of a rich sugar syrup, and then it's finished off with, with a cold cream because you want that textural difference. Um, now what we do at Dead Rabbit is we would have a sous vide, um, not to be too sensitive, it's just a water bath, uh, but we would hold the coffee and the sugar mixture in that water bath so that the coffee, you can, it can sit all day, um, and because it's, uh, it's, it's circulated in the, in the water bath, there's no hot spots. So you're not going to get a, like a burnt uh, coffee note. Um, and it also means the coffee that you serve at 10 a.m. is the exact same Irish coffee that you're serving at 1 a.m. Um, so it's, uh, that's, that, that's what we do there. Um, and it was going very, very well. And everybody was very happy. Um, <laughs> but Sean wasn't happy. And Sean's very rarely happy. Um, and he, he wanted to... Uh, he wanted to get Dale LeGroff in to revisit the Irish coffee in the tap room. Um, and for those of you who have been in the Dead Rabbit, it's a multi-level bar. So we have a tap room, which is like our version of a, of a great Irish pub. We have a, a, a parlor, which is a world, like an our version of a world-class cocktail bar, because the background that we came from was uh, world-class hotel cocktail bars. But we also love Down and Dirty Irish bars. And we wanted to bring these, these two together. And that's a whole other story. Um, so we were this this whole thing. We were going to get Dale Groff in to redo the Irish coffee for the tap room, but I was like, we can't get him in to just do one floor. It has to be like we're we're all doing it. We're all singing off the same hymn sheet. Um, so Dale came in, um, and the co the Irish coffee to the left here was my Irish coffee, um, as you can see, has a, a lovely dusting of nutmeg. Um, and then Dale Groff came in and said, absolutely not. That has to go. Um, so our current Irish coffee has no nutmeg, but a lot of people come to Dead Rabbit and they'll, they will specify that they want the nutmeg on. And I'm obviously the person who's uh, pushing this agenda. Uh, so, so. But don't, but don't, uh, don't tell Dale. Um, so that's, that's where we are with the Irish coffee. So right now we have Dale DeGroff's version, like it's actually his recipe. Um, and it would be on the sweeter side where our old one would have been more on, like it would have had a, a pure pot, a single pot still. Irish whiskey, we have a blend in the new one, um, which is sweeter. It's got a bit more sugar in it, and it has no uh, nutmeg on it. And what I find is when you, when you make a uh, steamed milk, it kind of brings on that like weird, like a uh, burnt flavor. Mm. Um, and with this, with this, the way we do the Irish coffee now, when you're, it, it starts off perfectly, but then when you get halfway through because of the hot liquid underneath, it's cooking that cream above, and it gives you, it just gives a different flavor that I don't enjoy. Now, don't get me wrong, our Irish coffee sales have not been diminished whatsoever um, with this move, but personally, I'm still a bit upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I would share that with you. So, um, and then Charlotte has rounded up a whole yeah. uh, bunch of drinks from other bartenders uh, across the world who are using or not making their drinks, so I'm going to hand you over to you for that. Yeah, so just a couple of other um, uses, great uses of nutmeg out there in the cocktail world at the moment. This one is by the ingenious Nico de Soto, whose bar is called Mace in New York. So he was the first person I called. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been there, it's, uh, it's amazing. His cocktail is driven by spice. So every cocktail is named after a spice, whether it's cardamom or fennel seed or coriander or, in this case, mace. And he drives uh, all of the ingredients of his cocktail from that one spice rather than the base spirit, which is quite a, a different way of looking at it. 
Uh, he's, he's one of the few that truly, in my opinion anyway, has original thought. His cocktails are, are quite special. Um, anyway, this is one of his signatures. It's called Mace, from Mace, so <laughs> don't forget that. Uh, <laughs> so it's an Aquavit cocktail. He uses beet juice. He's very, very um, innovative with his cocktail ideas. Um, and as a garnish here, he's used a mace sort of spray, which, again, <laughs> it's not mace spray. It's a mace spray. <laughs> <laughs> Just to uh, clarify the difference there. It's like an infusion that, or a tincture, rather, that he uses. And it goes back to this idea of aromatics, right? If the idea of um, garnish in a cocktail is twofold, the presentation and aroma, here we're ticking off the aroma box, and I think you'll agree the, just the glassware and the elegance of the color is enough to make the cocktail look beautiful. Uh, the next drink we have here is from uh, Lauren Young at Dante, who has a pop-up across the street. You should go visit um, the, the aperitif bar while you're here at Tales of the Cocktail. Um, truly sort of just beautified the aperitif moment um, and famous for his fluffy juice. <laughs> um, which, no, it's true. Very taken really simple drinks and just made them yeah. very elegant and delicious uh, through a slightly different use of technique. So this is his pina colada version, pina colada fresca. It's quite light. You can see the ingredients is very simple, um, but the nutmeg in this one really pulls everything together. Um, so think about that. Actually, when Peter and I were in the Caribbean uh, on the research trip for your education. The first, the first drink we ordered was a pina colada, and mm -hmm. it came with nutmeg, and it was great. So it just gives a bit more depth, a bit more sort of depth and dimension in the way that Angostura bitters might to a cocktail because of that aroma. Um, this is a insight, one of my favorite things we learned from the research from the Broken Shaker in Miami and Chicago and soon downtown Los Angeles and who knows where else. It's such a great bar, it's spreading quickly. I uh, spoke to Gabe, and this was quite interesting. So what they do is they actually smoke nutmegs um, on, their, on their meat smoker, and what they find is that kind of cooking process brings out some sugars. It almost caramelizes sugars, and it reminded me of the effects of charring barrels before we age whiskey or other spirits. Uh, or how a lot of people cook pineapples now. Yeah, or grilled pineapple, and then you might make a syrup or an ingredient from that. It introduces, again, more depth and dimension uh, to a cocktail, and they particularly like it with pineapple cocktails. So that's something else you can do with your nutmeg uh, from those guys. This one comes to us from uh, Rich Woods, a duck and waffle in London. Um, he has a cocktail that uses uh, nutmeg twice, once in the bark cordial he infuses with nutmeg, and then again in the formica and nutmeg uh, bitters. Uh, formica is foreign for ants, for any co-vegetarians in the room. Stay away, <laughs> just so you know. Um, this uh, beautiful drink from our dear friend Francesco La Franconi, um, the only person still using Passoa liqueur. Joking, joking, <laughs> but a uh, beautiful passion fruit liqueur. But again, uh, just to show that um, we associate nutmeg with, whether it's creamed drinks or hot toddies, but it truly can be used in a variety of ingredient combinations. So great with um, f uh, tropical fruits as well. Uh, and then a couple of drinks from the aviary, uh, who will be hosting a tasting room on Saturday afternoon with William Grant and Sons. You're all welcome to come. Just <laughs> show your wristbands on arrival. Uh, we do have a couple of these drinks. This one's called Up the Ice Ante. And if you can see on the photograph on the left-hand side, there are several discs of ice. Each one has a different flavor. And these ice discs are put into the cocktail for you to enjoy. And one of them is, is with nutmeg. So they've actually used it to create an ice disc, which then bleeds into the cocktail offering mm. flavor. Um, and this cocktail will be served on Saturday afternoon at the William Grant & Sons Tasting Room. <laughs> uh, and then loaded to the gun walls is another drink from the aviary. They're quite famous for this one. The presentation is spectacular, as most of their drinks are. Um, and again, there's a mace tincture here, so they've used mace, uh, they've extracted the, the flavor of mace in a tincture and added that back into the cocktail. Aroma and flavor, again, it's one of those ingredients that ticks both of those boxes very well. Um, this one is from Megan Dorman, who runs a series of bars in New York, if you're not familiar, Rain's Law Room, Dear Irvin, and then the Bennett, which is her new bar. They use nutmeg in a variety of cocktails across the board. They also use it in their house falernum recipe, which is a common use for nutmeg, I'm sure you'll know. 
this is the, her hero of Little Venice. Um, it's more of a flip style cocktail that she uses nutmeg on the top there. And then a couple of drinks from Lauren Mote. Lauren is um, from Canada. For those of you that may know Lauren, um, she's the co-founder of Bittered Sling Bitters Company, uh, but she also runs bars up in Canada and she's a tremendous ambassador for her country and the industry. Um, and this is one of her cocktails here. There's a nice sort of lengthy explanation as to how the nutmeg uh, works in here. Or she, rather, she's using mace, so she's focusing on the idea of that casing and bringing that to life. Um, her second cocktail here actually combines nutmeg with lavender, which might sound a bit strange, but actually nutmeg and floral is something we see coming up, particularly in vermouth recipes. Unfortunately, most vermouth recipes are secret, so no one ever tells us exactly what's in them. Uh, but you do find often nutmeg and floral goes together quite well. It's an unusual combination, but again, it can bring out some, or highlight rather, some lovely delicate flavors on the florals. Um, the next drink, or the drink you have rather, been patiently waiting to drink, or haven't. Uh, <laughs> this last one, we wanted to put together sort of a celebrate in the Caribbean, a rum-based cocktail style. This is just a simple swizzle. The base is Sailor Jerry and Flor de Cana. As most kind of great rum drinks, they use a couple of rums because what's better than one rum? Two, Two rums. rums. <laughs> um, and then our Grenadian nutmeg simple syrup, which Peter and I bravely traveled to Grenada to bring Smuggled back, back all your education. Smuggled this back. Smuggled back and then completely forgot in New York. So my colleague Jim had to bring it back in into town yesterday and had some interesting conversations with the TSA. Um, I think it was almost like the crime scene tape, right, that you had from the TSA, like do not cross. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this cocktail. Um, of course, here is an example where the nutmeg on top pulls all of the spice and body from the rums and really ties in that way. So it's kind of a, a plus plus situation, whereas the Army and Navy was the nutmeg drawing out from a more delicate base. This is like, you know, the more the merrier. Um, so we hope you enjoy that one. Lastly, we just wanted to talk through um, nutmeg as an ingredient in some other liqueurs and ingredients that you have in the bar. Um, a lot of these things you're very familiar with, but did you know that nutmeg was sort of the unsung hero of a lot of these ingredients? For example, Benedictine. Um, a lot of these, again, secret recipes. Uh, we can share some of the ingredients they have with you, 20, 27 herbs and spices or botanicals used in the production of, of nutmeg, of Benedictine. What's interesting here is Benedictine's been using nutmeg since 1510, or so they tell us. I believe them. Uh, which was sort of right there in the Nathaniel's nutmeg yep. moment, right? So yeah. it's, it's sort of, if you think about how valuable nutmeg was then, how valuable sort of Benedictine and how special it was as an ingredient to use. Especially when you think of liqueurs as uh, a way to preserve beneficial medicinal properties of uh, ingredients. You know, you'd want to have nutmeg in there because of it provided so many things that you want that in your key, as a key ingredient to your liqueur. Yeah, and, and 1510, we're definitely still in that we're drinking for medicinal purposes regime, right? Um, so here what they largely do is it's an, a maceration of mace um, and talking to the guys from Benedictine, what they love about what mace gives to their product, it's that sort of mid-palate note. It's a, it's a woody, earthy depth that you get kind of on the mid-palate, which really ties in nicely with their array of botanicals, some which, of which are very, very light and floral, but the nutmeg really provides this other dimension uh, which without, it would be quite sort of singular uh, and simple. Another one is Noali Pratt Vermouth, specifically the Ombre, uh, launched in 85, uh, only really recently available, certainly here in the United States. Uh, it doesn't really have too many classic cocktails because it's a new product, but relies heavily on nutmeg, a key ingredient, along with the likes of cardamom and lavender. So we see that combination again here. Um, and then some other Amaros, again, I sort of tried to fact check some of these and the usual response I got back was, maybe we use it, <laughs> but we can't tell you. <laughs> uh, from the likes of uh, the guys at Angostura, Amari de Angostura, fantastic Amaro, 
Um, if you taste it, you can probably tell yourself if nutmeg is in there or not. Um, but again, just because of their, their policies, they weren't able to confirm it. Um, but Contrato Fernet, which is a, a beautiful um, Fernet, and their Vermouth series use nutmeg um, and some others there. And this... This comes from Brad Parsons' new book, which is available in October. It's available for pre-order, so a little plug for Brad. A uh, great guy who uh, puts together some wonderful publications. Um, and then some other uses for nutmeg. We spoke a little bit about this with uh, Peter and Jack. We heard about infusing the egg white. Um, definitely you can use those knobs, grind them up to make a syrup or even a tincture. Remember, sort of alcohol will extract flavor well to make a, a tincture of nutmeg. And then even just grinding up and using uh, nutmeg for flavored salts or sugars that you might do a, a rim or a half rim for cocktails in there. I don't know if you guys had any other thoughts there on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I love doing flavored sugars and salts particularly, so taking the remainder of the nub, the, the nub and grinding it up and putting it to there is a great twist. Great yeah, twist. even something like a sidecar, which mm -hmm. obviously is a beautiful cocktail that classically calls for a sugar rim, which is a little passe these days, but it adds nicely back to the drink. Add a little nutmeg and you've instantly got a bit more depth and flavor. Um, yeah, so that's what we have for you guys. We do have uh,